Hello, NaNoWriMo. I am Grant Faulkner. I'm executive director of NaNoWriMo. Thank you for joining us for today's special webcast. Uh, this is a great topic. I think almost every author, um, after they finish their novel, they want to know, how do you find an agent? And it's a super challenging, dizzying process. And I say that from personal experience. I am actually uh, looking for an agent right now for a novel that I that I just I just finished, and um, so I'm going through all the same questions that you are. Even though I've gone through you know this process before as well, I think I think what makes it really challenging for me is it's it's, it's like applying for a job. I think that's the best analogy I can come up with. And and I've written everything from you know um, press releases to poems, uh, but writing a cover letter or an agent query I find to be horribly challenging. And I th I think it's because as novelists, most of us aren't comfortable really pitching our work. You know, it's a really, it's a, there's an art to that and it takes a lot of practice. And so I'm super happy today that we've got um, Reedsy sponsoring uh, today's webinar and that two Reedsy experts are here with us, um, Aaron Young and Nathan Bransford to kind of guide us through the process. And just to introduce uh, Nathan and Aaron, Nathan, Bransford is an editor and former agent with Curtis Brown Limited, uh, where he represented a wide range of authors, including Barry Gifford, Lisa Brackman, Jennifer Hubbard, and the estate of Winston Churchill. I think we should have a special segment at the end to go over the estate of Winston Churchill. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. What, what is definitely. Uh, uh, Nathan is also an author. He's written uh, Jacob Wonderbar, uh, author of the Jacob Wonderbar series, actually, in the nonfiction book, How to, uh, to Write a Novel. And I, Nathan's actually known to a lot of NaNoWriMo writers because he's been writing for NaNoWriMo for, I don't know, at least six, seven, eight years on his blog. He has a slew of resources. I invite you to check them out, uh, NaNoWriMo resources and, and other writing resources. And you can find them at blog.nathanbransford.com. So please check those out and welcome, Nathan. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And Aaron Young is an editor and the founder of EY Literary Management. Uh, for four years, Aaron was an agent at Distal, Goderich, and Barrett. I don't know if I pronounced that right. Um, you did. Yeah. <laughs> good. Uh, where she worked with New York, New York Times bestselling authors on a number of critically acclaimed titles. Uh, Aaron also holds an MFA in creative writing. Um, and she still writes. Uh, before that, though, she worked, she was telling me earlier that she worked as a zoologist, uh, which gave her a great love of all animal related literature. Um, she uh, is interested in representing all forms of young adult and middle grade fiction, particularly fantasy, action adventure, and magical realism, which I know a lot of NaNoWriMo writers write. Thanks for joining us, Erin. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. And uh, Ricardo, Ricardo Fayette is one of the founders of Reedsy, and Reedsy is sponsoring uh, today's webcast. And if you don't know Reedsy, it's an online marketplace that connects authors with editors, designers, marketers, and website designers uh, like Aaron and Nathan. And today, um, uh, Reedsy is offering a special discount on its services. And Ricardo, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I'm sure. So, um... When deciding a, a topic to, to kind of to sponsor for NaNoWriMo, uh, I thought about query letters because whenever we write anything on our blog or we do any webcasts or resources, query letters are always the most popular read and we've got the chance that, uh, as Grant was saying, we're a marketplace of really, really curated uh, freelance professionals, um, among which editors. Uh, and a lot of our editors come from traditional publishing backgrounds. So some of them were agents in the past or are still agents like uh, Nathan and Aaron uh, with us on this uh, webcast. Uh, a lot of others are or were uh, acquisi um, acquisition editors uh, at big traditional publishing companies. So we've got, we thought uh, it'd be great to, to do a webcast on, uh, on queries and bring to uh, read C editors um, to talk about it. So I'm going to be mostly quiet, but I did want to be here to mention that uh, discount uh, link that one of my colleagues should be posting in the comments. It's readsy.com forward slash loves forward slash nano, readsy.com loves nano. Um, and that should give you $30 credits uh, that will be applied if you decide to hire at any point in the future. It can be one year, two years from now, one week, one hour from now. Uh, if you decide to hire an editor or a designer or website designer through ET. Um, so yeah, that's all gift on top of the sponsorship of the um, of this webcast, which I hope is going to be helpful to everyone in the audience. Thanks, Ricardo. It's going to be helpful. And thanks for making that URL, Reedsy Loves Nano. Cannot get enough love. <laughs> um, 
one can never get enough love. Uh, well, I want to start out like I'm imagining that moment when you, an author or writer, finishes his or her novel and decides to get an agent. You know, it's this big new scary realm, and there's so much to learn. Um, what would be uh, your your first bit of advice? Uh, I'll start with you, Aaron. How would you? What would you tell a um, a new newly published novel or finished novel? Um. My first bit of advice is to research your agents. You really want to know who you want to represent your novel. First of all, I think so many authors are trying to find who would want their novel, but I don't think they ever really think, who do I want to represent my novel? And that's a very important question to ask as well, because I think it brings you to the answer of who's going to be the best to represent your novel quicker than if you were just to look for somebody who's going to accept your novel. It's a collaborative um, effort. So you need to you know, find the person that you want as well as the person that's gonna want you. And so building on that a bit, Nathan, how do you find the person that you want? Cause like, I find that, you know, when I first started looking for agents way back in the day, I think I thought there were like 50 agents in the world, but it seems like there's hundreds, maybe thousands of agents to, to research. How, how would yeah. you find the best for you? Yeah, I, I mean, first, I really echo what Aaron said, and it's really important to, to research agents and to really um, to first educate yourself on the on the publishing industry and entirely. Uh, learning, um, you know, how to spot a reputable agent versus someone who's not reputable. Knowing, making sure you know your rights, uh, making sure you know the the general the generalities of how the the business works entirely. And uh, there are wealth of resources that will get you started on that. My blog is one of them, but there are others as well. And uh, so first is, I think it starts with education. Um, secondly, I think, you know, it's great to have a spreadsheet that you start that you, as you sort of begin to research agents, uh, making sure you're tracking uh, the agent, who they represent, um, and any notes you see about them that might help you remember them, them later and that you'll later be able to use to personalize the query. Um, there are also a lot of databases that will um, that will let you uh, search by genre, so you can search the, the databases like Agent Query and others uh, that will give you a list of agents who represent your genre. But from there, your work doesn't stop there. You really want to research agents individually, make sure they're reputable, make sure, and then look at look at their presence online, look who they've represented, um, and and just see if who you feel just a gut feeling about or that you feel like might be an especially good fit for your work. Uh, but don't don't just do the research. Make sure you're tracking and cataloging it because it will be very useful to you later. Now, uh, just following up, that's great advice. Um, and and later on, I think I have a question asking you guys for your favorite research um, uh, sources. So we can we can go through that a little bit later as well. Um, now I'm thinking like one of the one of the bits of advice I received early on was to read the acknowledgments page of my favorite right. novels, and and. And, and also using some of the resources that you just mentioned, you can find uh, who represents your favorite authors pretty easily these days. Uh, so my question though is that my favorite authors, most of them are, are super successful authors and they have these, these really big name agents. And so not only am I kind of intimidated to, to submit to those agents, but I'm, I'm guessing that those agents have full lists and that I might not rank high enough to, to, to merit their attention. So is it is it better to to go with like a younger, hungrier, less known agent, or do, do, do you still stand a chance of being represented if you go for those bigger agents? I think you can definitely still have a chance. I mean, those bigger agents are always taking on new authors. Um, you know, I worked for a, as an assistant when I was learning to become an agent, um, I worked for a big name author, Michael Barrett, who, you know, sold tons of, of YA novels and has tons of uh, New York Times bestseller author, selling authors on his list. And um, he still took on new clients every month. I would say he, his goal was to take on two to three new clients every, every one or two months. So, you know, I wouldn't sell yourself short and, you know, not go for those bigger agents. You do want to do a good mix of them, though, I would say. Um, always look for the, the newer agents because you never know, you might just click with them much better than the older agents. You know, sometimes you, you have a, a new author coming into the business and they're not comfortable with these bigger agents because they might be a little bit pushier. They might, you know, direct you in a direction that they think is good 
because they have the ego and they they think that they know exactly what they that your book needs. But maybe what your book actually needs is you know a, a newer agent who's going to allow you to take the reins. Um, so you know it it just kind of depends upon what you want. But I wouldn't sell yourself short and not go for those larger agents. What do you think, Nathan? Yeah, I, I echo that, and um, I think. Uh, yeah, definitely. Big agents are always looking for new, new, um, new clients. It's still there is there is something to be said for younger agents, though. And um, sometimes younger agents may be a little bit more willing to work with the author on revisions and things before going out on submission. Um, sometimes younger agents might be willing to go a little bit more of the extra mile and going down to some of the smaller publishers and things like that to. Um, really build up the author over the long haul, whereas a, um, a, a bigger agent might stop at uh, the major publishers um, and things like that. It's a good conversation to have with an agent if they're, if they're interested in representing you. Uh, if you are going to choose or consider a younger agent, um, you know, every agent starts with zero sales. And so, uh, and everyone starts out somewhere. So even if an agent doesn't have a huge track record, that's not necessarily a reason to discount them. At the same time, you do want to make sure that they have uh, some really good publishing experience, apprenticing with a very experienced agent. By the time that I began representing um, authors, I had been worked for several years for one of the top agents in publishing. I kind of knew the business um, pretty thoroughly at that point and had a great foundation and, p and resources to draw upon if I ever had questions or needed to know how to do something. You want to look for someone like that and not someone who just hung out their shingle or just is getting started, but maybe they have um, um, kind of a, a not not as established background in the publishing industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to, to jump in there too, I just want to say that um, you should make sure that the newer agents have somebody backing them as well. Right. I know when I first started, I was I had Michael Barrett backing me the whole time, so that if I was reading a contract and I didn't necessarily understand what was there, he was there with all of his experience to show me exactly what I needed to know. Yep. Do you hear about anybody these days who publishes a book without finding an agent with a, with a, a significant publisher? It it happens, and um, and there are all there, you know I've heard all kinds of stories um, over the years of of uh, somebody somehow getting their foot in the door, or an editor meets somebody at a at a conference and things like that. I will I will say though that even if you have interest directly from a publisher, I still would recommend getting an agent because the contract that you're gonna get directly from a publisher is is not the type of agreement you're gonna get if you go through a literary agency. Every literary agency has boilerplate agreements with the major publishers where uh, the terms are negotiated in a much, much better way than you're gonna get on your own. And, um, and also an agent will be able to uh, help manage the process, make sure that things are going well and be thinking about your career in the long term. And so definitely, you know, it's okay to, to tell, uh, I, I would tell a publisher as soon as possible if they're interested that you're still hoping to find an agent just so that they're in the loop on that. But it's okay to, go, to have an offer, go to an agent and be like, hey, I have this author, will you represent me? And it, it's worth your 15% to do that. You're gonna get a better deal. Yeah, yeah. and uh, uh, sorry, but I was gonna say, if, if somebody, you know, Sends sends their manuscript to to an editor. It's very it, at a publishing house. It's very very unlikely or or not likely at all that it will be read, right? At, at a big five publisher. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it, you'd have to have some other kind of personal connection in order for that to happen. They're they're not even going to really read it. Yeah, for the, for the most part. I'm sure there are exceptions, but for the most part. And I think I interrupted you, Aaron. You were going to say something earlier. Yeah, I just want to say I had a client who got published by an independent publishing house. So they were they were taking unsolicited manuscripts. And it ended up kind of coming back to bite him because he he didn't know what exactly was in the contract. Mm -hmm. And it ended up being that they had an option on his next three novels, which kind of put a damper on us then selling those next three novels. So there are little things in these contracts that can really impact your career that an agent is going to know about. And if you're if you don't know them, you know you could be putting yourself in a position where you can't get an agent when you really need one coming later. Yeah, and another thing I'd add there is that a lot of times when people get contracts and offers uh, directly from publishers, they may have like their attorney friend look at the contract, or or may have hire an attorney just to review the legality. 
but um, it's that's not the thing you're really even you even necessarily need as much. What you really need is someone who knows what's customary in the business and knowing things like an option for three more books uh, open ended is not customary, not something you want to sign away. Uh, so make sure that um, you know if if you are going to have our attorney review it, that they have publishing experience and they know what's customary, not just the sort of nuts and bolts of contracts and things like that. Yeah, I totally back you up. When I first read through my contract, my book contract, it was, yeah, that it was way beyond me to truly understand what was good or bad in it, or even understand some of the things in general. Um, Cause you got foreign rights, you got a lot of eBooks, audio books, a lot of different things going on. Um, well, let's, let's get into this query letter. Um, the, the, the beginning of it all after your research, I guess. Um, tell us what is a query letter? And, and, and what makes a good one or what goes into it? I'll start with you, Aaron. So a query letter is the first letter that your agent is going to, or the agent that you are submitting to is going to see. Um, and it serves to inter introduce you and your work. Um, and sorry, what was the second part of your yeah, it's exactly that. Like, like, what is it? What goes into a, a query letter? What are okay. what are the basics, the best practices? You know, what should people be thinking of? Yeah. So you should first of all be thinking about addressing this letter specifically to the agent. Uh, you want to make sure that you've done your research. You know what this agent likes. You know who this agent is. And when you're querying them, that you you are addressing them and not just all agents in general. Um, so the first thing that you want is an introduction and something about them. And then you wanna go into your pitch of your novel. And then finally you'll do your bio and all about you. Mm -hmm. And the something about them, tell me like that, that first paragraph is sometimes the most challenging. What does that mean? Something yeah, about them. it can be challenging, but I always like to say the easiest way is just to say, hey, I read your bio and I see that you're interested in X, Y, Z. Maybe they're interested in zombies and um, kittens. And then you say, wow, that's amazing because I have a novel that's about zombies and kittens. So I think that you would really enjoy this. Um, I mean, definitely write it a little bit more formally than that, but <laughs> that that's the, uh, the gist of it. Yeah. Anything to add, Nathan? Yeah. So, I mean, I think the the... The query letter is really difficult to write. I mean, it's um, it's really difficult to encapsulate all the you know the entirety of your novel in just a few uh, short paragraphs. Um, I recommend that's about two hundred fifty to three hundred fifty words. I totally agree to lead with the personalization. Really make sure that the agent knows that um, you chose them, that you researched them, that there's a reason that you're querying them directly. And the reason for that isn't because I when I used to be an agent, I needed to be kissed up to or something like that. It's just that when when I see an author who's um, who, who has done the research, it, it bodes well for the fact for that person as an author that that there's someone who took their writing seriously. That they're going to take the business of, of being a writer seriously, uh, knows the industry conventions, and has gone the extra mile. And there's a correlation between that that just brief personalization at the top and a manuscript that I'm going to be interested in. Uh, you don't have to go, you know, <laughs> write a song about the agent. You don't have to write paragraphs about them. Just a brief, quick, personalized mention is great. Then uh, a plot summary and uh, and summarizing your work. And to me, there are two main goals in, in, in that, in, as you're pitching your work. One is that you want to tell the agent what is literally happening in your book. What is the plot? Uh, you don't want to summarize it really vaguely like, um, um, oh, this is a story, a coming of age story about um, a penguin who went to college. Like, it, you know, you, you want to tell what literally happens in the book uh, and be as specific about the plot as possible. Um, I have a template that, on my blog that you can you can check out that um, that gives you the basic starting place. But from there, you really want to flesh it out with um, with specificity and details. And that gets to the second main thing I think you need to accomplish, which give give the agent a sense of what it's like to read your book. If, you're, if it's funny, write a funny query. If it's creepy, write a creepy query. You know, you really want to give them a sense of the flavor. And to do that, I recommend just infusing some of those little details that makes your your um, your novel unique. So I want to go back up to that lead paragraph one more time and just mention mm -hmm. that that most 
agents or many agents have given interviews to to magazines or they have interviews on people's blogs and so when i when i'm um writing that first paragraph i'm i, I it's, it's a great way actually to go beyond just their what they say on their their agent website to actually get a little bit more into the personality of how they handle their clients and and usually i find some nugget within that interview uh to to relate to them you know and it, it is exactly what you guys are saying i think i've, I've read that you know so, so many agents get essentially like this email blast right the, and and they'll know that the the writer has sent it to 50 other agents and not personalized it at all you know it, it is like applying for a job in that sense uh we also get job cover letters like that um but i wanted to go back into the synopsis uh that you mentioned nathan and, and get mm -hmm. a little bit of uh some perspective from this on aaron uh because i find the synopsis i mean you're talking about like what do you say two paragraphs three paragraphs at most two or three paragraphs yeah yeah so that's maybe i don't know 100 125 words it's not much and to encapsulate this is like so this is why it's so challenging because you are pitching it and you are summarizing it and you have to deal with uh issues like am i ruining the story by telling the ending here do you tell the ending how much do you tell so aaron can you give us some tips on writing that synopsis or pitch how much is it is it a pitch and how much is it a synopsis it's not a synopsis at all i would i would just take the word synopsis and and take it out of your mind we don't want to know everything about your novel um, because the only thing that the pitch is, is trying to do is to get an agent to read more. Um, I, you don't want to mislead them with your pitch and make them think that your novel is something that it's not, but you want to give them just enough so that they say, wow, this sounds interesting. I'm going to read more. They don't need to know every detail because there's a big chance that they probably won't read your whole novel and they don't really care. Um, but if you give them just enough so that they go, hmm, I'm going to read more, then they're going to go go on to your 10 pages. And that's where, you know, your query letter can be perfected as much as possible. But if your 10 pages aren't working, you know, that's that's where the real uh, when, the, when the real test comes in. But really, the pitch should just be enough so that the agent can say, this is really interesting. I want to know more. And I always say that you shouldn't tell the end because it's kind of like the copy on the back of a book. Do they tell you the end? No, because if they did, then you might think, oh, that end kind of sucks. I don't want to read the book. <laughs> um, and if you don't tell them, they might think, oh, that's, you know, what happens at the end? I want to know more. I like that analogy to the copy on the back of the book. Is that, is that essentially what the, the pitch should be in the, the letter? Go yeah, ahead, Nate. I, I mean, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, it's it's close. It's it's they're similar but not identical because if you notice the typically the copy on the on the uh, back of the book um, or inside of the jacket is longer and tends to include a little bit more detail. Um, and but but I think that that Aaron's way of thinking about it is very good. You don't need to tell exactly what happens from start to finish. Um, and it, I think it's okay not to, to tell how it ends and to just give it, you re, what you're really giving is the, the central conflict and arc of the book. You're giving this, giving a sense of what, what's the journey that your main character or main characters are going on. Um, and, uh, sometimes I, sometimes when you, you know, writers can hear, oh, I don't need to tell the end. So they, then they kind of internalize this advice of, oh, I, well, I don't want to give anything away. And it's like, don't worry about that. Don't worry about spoiling things for the agent. Don't If there's a big surprise that happens in the first third of the book, don't not tell them the big surprise if it's an important part of the plot just because you're worried about spoiling the book. Agents read so many books, they're never surprised. <laughs> I'm, I'm not surprised at any book I read anymore just because I've read so many, I can see exactly what's going to happen based on the craft alone. Um, and so don't worry about spoiling things but 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 don't try and cut, you know cram everything into the query and i realize i'm saying things that are this is why it's so hard to write as i'm saying you know don't sit don't tell the end but don't be too vague and you know include stuff but don't include too much and that's the hard that's why it's so hard to write and so hard to do but um there's certain things that just need to be in there so the things that need to be in there are like what's the quest that the character or characters are going on like what's the big obstacle um, and then what are the, what are some of those details that make your book, your book, and that really make it stand out. And once, if you have all those things and mush them all together, um, and then try and make it make sense, you're 75% of the way there. Yeah. So you have to bring all your authorial knowledge and instincts to bear on those two or three paragraphs. And I think so. Yeah. 
itself. Aaron, you mentioned something earlier. You said you referred to the 10 pages that you include with the query. Now, is that, is that standard to include 10 pages? I mean, I know different, different agents want different things, and I, I've read some agents that only want the query. They don't want any. Yeah, it's, it's not standard at all. Everybody's different. And you can find those guidelines on the website um, of the agent that you're querying. Um, and I would highly recommend reading those rules as, as well as you can and make sure that you check off every single one before you submit a query because if you're not following every single one of those rules, that's an automatic rejection. Yeah. yeah, put those put those rules in your spreadsheet that you started at the beginning and make sure that they're in there and you're following them totally. That's really good advice. Good advice. I just remembered I didn't tell the viewers that uh, we want at, at a certain point and actually soon in five or 10 minutes, we're going to turn it over to you. So put your questions in the chat and uh, our, my producer, Catherine Grip, will send them to me and I'll ask uh, Aaron and Nathan. Um, now, now back to the the excerpt that you include, or that an agent might um, ask for. What if you just decide, well, I'll just include the whole novel, and they can read the the, the first ten pages <laughs> off there? <laughs> Dude, is that good? No, no, that's an instant rejection. I mean, it's there's a reason the queries exist, um, and authors hate them. And uh, I've, I've, you know, and when I was an agent, I was an agent for eight years, and I spent heard eight years of complaints about query letters, and. Um, it, it, there's a reason they exist, which is that, you know the, the agent wants to get a sense of what the book's about, what you're about in a succinct way, and the query letter just happens to be the best way that everyone's figured out how to do that. Um, and so there's no avoiding them. And you know even if there were a way where you know you just had a foot in the door and the agent jumped straight to the manuscript, you're as an author, you're still gonna have to summarize your work. You're gonna have to be good at it even past the query stage. You know, your publisher is gonna gonna draw upon you to help write the jacket copy. Um, you're gonna be interviewed, hopefully, and talking about your book all the time. You need to describe it succinctly. Um, so, getting in the habit of, of of succinctly describing your work and getting someone interested is a crucial skill as an author. Um, so, it's not some torture device that the publishing industry invented. It's a crucial skill that you need to develop if you want to have people read your book. Yeah, it shows exactly how professional you are. Right. That's that's the thing about it. And on that note, because I know that you are, you know, a writer is proving his or her professionalism with query letter. And part of that, you mentioned this, Aaron, is that at some point in the query letter, you, you start talking about who you are and, and your credentials. And I'm thinking a lot of writers who haven't published, uh, they might not know what to put there. How, how, how would you guide them? Um, I would say if you can write anything that shows your ability ability to write this book, uh, that helps. You know, if you're writing a business book about computers and you are an IT professional, that kind of stuff is important. If you're writing a middle grade fantasy and you happen to be a middle grade teacher, that kind of stuff is important because it shows that you understand your audience. Mm -hmm. So just searching for any kind of kernel of relevance there. Yeah. 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 But I, I also like that's that's I agree with all that. I, th I also think um, don't overthink the bio. I mean, too. I mean, it, it, the most important thing is the is this is the is the story and the, the description of the, of the plot. If, the, if you have something to say that's related, great. If you don't, it's totally fine, too. I mean, I think it's, um, you know, it, you, it's totally fine to just say I'm I work doing such and such or I don't and I live in such and such and uh, this is my first novel. That's a totally acceptable bio. Like just giving the agent a little bit of a sense of who you are is great, but it's not going to be the thing that makes or breaks you unless it's nonfiction, in which case that bio is, is really important because the agent's going to want to know why you are the most authoritative person to write the book. So nonfiction, important, novel, don't sweat it. So you yeah. get in, you haven't gone to an MFA program, you haven't published a bunch of short <laughs> stories, you don't live in Brooklyn, uh, <laughs> yeah. all those things, you still qualify based on your story. You're gonna say something, Aaron. Yeah, uh, we all know that JK Rowling was just a mom before she wrote Harry Potter, so uh, right. <laughs> we know that. Yeah, that's great to keep in mind. Uh, sh should, should authors mention their social media following in that little bio section? If you have it, sure. Um, yeah, if you have if you have a platform and you and you develop something that is going to help you um, with with promoting your book, whether that's you're known for short, writing short stories or you have a large social media presence, uh, that's great. Uh, so, so do do mention it. 
Um, but again, I, I just, at the end of the day, you, you could have zero followers on Twitter and, and have a great book in the publishing industry is still going to be interested in you. So um, uh, again, that type of thing is more important for, no, for nonfiction. Uh, for fiction, don't worry about it. Okay. Well, what about comp titles? I don't think anyone's mentioned comp titles. And I always hear that you're supposed to compare your novel to I don't know how many novels. Um, but but what, what kind of comp title advice would you recommend? I really don't like comp titles. I think they tend to pigeonhole your novel uh, into whatever two or three novels you're mentioning. They can also be a little bit misleading. Um, if you you know think that your book is like something else and then the agent is really excited about it and then they start reading your book and it's not like that book, it can really influence their opinion when they might have just liked it when they didn't have that opinion of it. Um, so I, I think it can be helpful because it might get an agent excited about your book, but it can also be kind of hurtful in that regard. Um, so I always recommend not to do it. I mean, it's not, it's not necessary and um, it's not really going to influence the agent enough to, to where you should worry about it. But that's just me. I think that that's a very subjective thing to think about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nathan? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I agree personally that I never really cared for them very much uh, when I was an agent. Um, but some people do like them. And so it is subjective. Um, I think if you are going to do it, um, the, I, the, the things I would recommend is, is one, don't compare your book to something that's massively popular because so many people do that. It doesn't really mean anything to compare your book to Harry Potter or the Da Vinci Code or uh, Fifty Shades of Grey. It just, it, it, it just doesn't really paint a picture for the, um, for the agent and the agents see that like 10 times a day. Um, and, uh, you know, you want, if you do it only if if it's good if it's like a good comparison is is evocative um but I, personally i i tend to think that uh, similarly to aaron where either it sets up false expectations or the agent maybe hasn't read one of the or both of the books you're comparing it to um and so they don't tend to land for me uh, mm -hmm. but to each their own and uh as long as you just don't compare it to harry potter then <laughs> yeah. it should be fine it's not going to be one of those things that makes or breaks your, your query letter. I did have Harry Potter on my list. Should one compare your novel to Harry Potter? That's a no. Or, <laughs> sort of classic. Um, I'm curious, though, like if, if people are following that kind of guidance to, to list comp titles, is there an, a, a magic number? Should you list two or three or 10 or? Oh, uh, well, go ahead, Aaron. Yeah. I would say two at least, uh, just because you don't you don't want to say like your book is exactly like another book because then we already have that book. That book's been published. So why are you rewriting it? Um, and you want to give them a, a better sense of what your book is about. And I think giving at least two titles will help. Great. Yeah. Now here's, here's a question. I think, um, just, just verify this any author looking for an agent, the novel should be finished, right? You can't have it be half finished or just a couple chapters that are great. It's gotta be all the way finished. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Okay, I good. <laughs> well, my next and, question. And edited too, by the way. I mean, I think you need to get as far as you, you, you can on your own. Don't, don't be sending an agent your diamond in the rough that hasn't been polished yet. Make sure it's as polished as you can on your own. Right, the, it's not the agent's job to say, oh, there's this spark of talent right. here. And I'm going to dedicate my life to developing. Right, right. Yeah. Um, well, let me ask. I'm, I'm going to go to some questions from our viewers here. Uh, Jojo Caperson asks, if if your debut book is over 100,000 words, how do you pitch that, or can you pitch a book of that length? Novel. I personally recommend not saying the length, um, <laughs> just because that might turn the agent off. I have plenty of times automatically rejected novels that have been over 100,000 words um, without even reading the rest of the query. Uh, and that's just because I didn't want to read a 100,000 book or 100,000 word book that was not going to be good. Um, but that might have also been to my detriment because maybe your book is really great and maybe I should have read on. So I just recommend not putting it in there. Mm -hmm. 
How about you, Nathan? Can you can you publish a big saga for your first debut? You you can. It just incrementally de decreases your odds. The longer your the, if your book is abnormally long or abnormally short, it's going to decrease your odds. Um, there are a lot of reasons for that. Everything from the cost of making the book to if it's really long to you know this the physical size on a bookshelf if it's really short, um, and uh, and also it's you know with a debut that people tend to be a little bit safer and a lot of the eccentric long massive books that you've read um tended not to be the author's debut uh, there are exceptions that there were some really long debuts but it's it's not the, it's not the rule um so to me it's more, the first thing is just um doesn't need to be as long as it is like and be genuinely honest with yourself about that it, are there things you can cut uh, does it really need to be 100,000, 120, 140,000 words? Uh, if, if it really does, and it's just you're being true to, to your novel, and you really did write this long, beautiful novel, um, like The Historian, which was a debut, um, and really long, um, then then grow for it. Just be aware that there are going to be agents who are going to be turned off by the length, publishers who might be turned off by the length, and it's just going to have to be that much better, but it does happen. so. Um, there are a lot of exceptions in the publishing industry. This word count is a slippery one that is definitely one of them. But um, if to, to increase your odds, I would try and stick it within the range of established um, um, genre conventions. And by the way, I also have a, um, a recent blog post about this where I, I talked about genre count ranges. So if you're curious about your um, the range for, for your genre, um, I have those ranges um, on a pretty recent post on my blog. Cool. I, uh, I just want to jump in there and say, yeah. if your book is over a hundred thousand words, I highly, highly recommend that you look for an editor because I work with a ton of clients through Reezy who have, you know, books that are well over a hundred thousand words and I work with them and we can get it down to 60,000 words. So you might think that you have everything in there that's necessary, but you can also find an editor who can work with you and get your story out in way less words. Yeah. Great. That's good to hear. Uh, this question comes from Melissa Kendall. She asks, what are some common mistakes you see made in query letters that we should avoid? Are there any common mistakes you'd like to, to tell about? How about for, for me, the, the, one, the most common mistake I see is um, people being vague. Uh, about what things that happen, um, and it's it's a tricky thing to to spot on your own because you know what happens. Um, but try and be as specific as possible about the things that the characters do and how they do them. And so um, you know, sometimes people are like, you know, uh, and there were there are secrets, and um, and and you know, the person had to rush to do this thing, but. What what were the secrets like? Where like what? How did they get there? And just being, it's those details that are so so important. So anything where you're brushing over something with either a cliche or a vague turn of phrase, where someone can't immediately picture the thing that's literally happening, uh, that that that's really the difference between a query letter that sounds like everything else and a query letter that really like sings. How about you, Aaron? That's great. I think being too long winded is a huge mistake because I know for myself, I read queries super fast. I don't get paid for reading queries. So I like to read a query in a minute. And if there's a really long query, I might skip over some of the things that you're saying. And that might be a detriment to you. And maybe it's a detriment to me as well, but that's just how I have to survive um, you know, to to make money in this business, you have to just get through it and keep going. And as an agent, you get tons and tons and tons of queries every day. So you just want to make sure that your query is short enough that the agent can read all the way through it. And so, I mean, you, your guidance earlier, both of your guidance was a query should be one page max. Is that right? Uh, so when you say I, I say two hundred and fifty to three hundred and fifty words, which is really about more like half a page. Yeah, yeah, same. Okay. Yeah, I read an interesting article, and I can't remember where I read this years ago, but it but it detailed the life of an agent or a day in the life of an agent, mm -hmm. and just just the the amount of queries that come in is, I mean, these days, especially with with email, it used to be you had to mail it, right? Um, it's it's just dizzying, you know. Yeah, it's, it's, 
thousands a year, thousands. I mean, is there that? It's like it's just a, a constant deluge. Yeah, it's it's almost like they say, you know, like like a marketing or advertising should speak to people in three seconds. <laughs> it's almost like that's what you're saying, Aaron. Yeah. A minute, a minute or less, definitely. Um, let me see here. There was a good question. Oh, Daniel Clark. So he's asking about that ten page excerpt that you mentioned earlier. Uh, he asked, "Do the ten pages come from the beginning or anywhere in the manuscript? Can you can you focus on a particularly wonderful section or start at the beginning?" Only the beginning. Only the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> For that nice lyrical interlude in the middle. He want, I mean, because that's where readers start, and so that's where the agent's going to start. Yeah. Um, Kat Clements, I think she's come to the right place. She asks, is there anywhere you can get your query letter looked at to see how it can be improved? Is that something Readsy handles? It is, yes. Um, I'll let Ricardo talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what uh, a lot of our editors do on Readsy. I mean, if you, if you sign up and you look at the marketplace, you can filter your search for editors by query letter review, which is a service that some of our editors provide. Uh, we do make sure that all the editors who provide query letter review services on Readsy do have experience with query letter review. So either um, experience as an agent or uh, an experience in acquisitions um, among publishers. So that's definitely something we do. Yeah, something we specialize in, actually. Yeah, it's great. I've gotten feedback not from Readsy editors, but from <laughs> fellow fiction writers who are very conversant in writing query letters. And it's it's the kind of thing that getting feedback is really, really important, or it has been for me, definitely. So I recommend it. Um, let's see here. Uh, Mary Jane Amelia asks an interesting question about memoir. And she wants to know, does memoir fall into the same category as fiction for the purpose of a query letter? Yeah, I really think so. I think that the rules of memoir um, tend to overlap more with novels than with traditional nonfiction, depending on who you are. I mean, if you are like a celebrity or a, you know a very famous person, then then it then it starts to be a little bit more in the realm of, of traditional nonfiction. But um, you know, the rules. For, I, I I and opinions also vary a little bit on this. But my personal feeling about memoirs is is that unless you're famous, you pretty much need to write the whole thing. It's much more dependent on your storytelling and the quality of your writing. Uh, than it is about whether you're famous or not. Um, and you should approach the query with that in mind, where you're really trying to tell the story and show the, the quality of the writing and convey those, those, those qualities to the agent. I just right. want to jump in and say famous um, in agent terms, too. Can be, I like to think of it as 50,000 followers on some platform plus. That's good specific guidance. Um, when I get to 50,000, I'm going to declare myself famous. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, yeah just, and just so we're clear here, um, like, uh, there's another question about nonfiction proposals, which are a totally different beast. You, you, you go beyond the query letter, right? You have to write a whole proposal, which can be quite involved. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, nonfiction book proposals uh, in, are, are different. A whole different animal, but but that said, and so you basically have to write, um, and, you know, an overview. You tend to have some sample pages. You write about your platform and things like that. But nonfiction, uh, even though a plat, uh, you know, a proposal should exist, nonfiction authors still need to write a good query letter. So that that they're not like exempt uh, from writing a query letter just because they're eventually going to send a proposal instead of a full novel. Mm -hmm. Good. Um... Well, Aaron, maybe you can tackle this one. Uh, this comes from, I guess, just C. Uh, do writers' conferences help authors land agents or publishing a contract? Um, is someone more or less likely to break into the field through that route? And I, I do hear more and more these days, you know, a lot of writers' conferences have these kind of speed dating for agents, kind of, you know, parts of the, the event. Have yeah. You? Yeah. I went to um, an SCBWI conference and I was uh, teaching through it and I actually signed up one of my clients for that. So yes, the answer is definitely. It's a great way to meet agents and to get your foot in the door. This next question is really great because I know a lot of NaNoWriMo writers are writing series. And um, Daniel Clark asks, if your novel is part of a series, how do you approach that? So he has two or three written. How would you mm -hmm. query series? Well, I mean, I my book became a series, and so I I, I had to send query letters, and so I feel um, 
like I uh, I can tackle this one. Um, it uh, you know, it's not as serious until the second book is published. And I say that even as someone who originally conceived of of my novel as as a series, there's some genres um, where series are are very popular. Um, they you know and series w kind of wax and wane in terms of popularity within the industry, but they tend to, to be pretty popular. But, but all that said, you know, you may send it to an agent who thinks that the novel would work best as a standalone as opposed to a series or send it to a publisher who may think it look, works better as a standalone than it's a potential series, or it may be published and then it may not um, um, do that well. And then, th then it just doesn't become a series. And so my advice in, 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 to navigate all of this, um, if you are envisioning as a series, that's okay to mention in the query letter, but uh, I wouldn't appear too wedded to the fact of it being um, a series because the agent may not agree, the publisher may not agree. Um, and so the way I recommend handling that is, just, is saying um, it's the first in a potential series, it's the first installment of a potential series. And, um, you know, it, even if you have written all three in your series and you're just now querying for the first one, I wouldn't mention that. And I'd still say exactly what I just said, which is it's the first of a potential series. And then if it ends up happening, um, that's great. Um, but uh, it may not, and it may just be one. It may be, you know, you may envision it as seven and it may end up being three. Um, so just be flexible. How about you, Aaron, anything to add? No, honestly, that's perfect. And exactly how I would handle it. <laughs> I don't know my my JK Rowling lore on this. I'm just very curious if she had the series worked out from book one or not. But that's a Google search for later, maybe. Yeah, I went to an exhibit recently in New York, and and I don't know that that question was definitively answered uh, about whether how how much of it she imagined in advance. Yeah. Uh, let's see. This comes from Tewo Tewo uh, Adesina, and she asks um, how, how how to choose between two agents. So if you have two competing agents, how do you choose between them if they're both reputable? I think this goes back to what I was saying before. Um, it depends upon your relationship with them. You're gonna be working with your agent, hopefully for the rest of your life. And it should be somebody that you feel excited about, somebody that looks at your work and really respects it. Uh, you know, it just, you wanna have that great connection. If you have a great connection with both of them, then I would say look more at, you know, what, even if you don't have a great connection with them, you should also be looking at, you know, what they're going to do for your novel. And when you're speaking with agents, when they um, decide to represent you, you should have a list of questions that you're going to ask them that go over the very specifics. Where do you plan on, on sending this novel? Um, you know, what, what is your background? Um, what do you see as the future of this novel? Uh, what exactly about my novel did you love? And what exactly about my novel would you change if you want to change anything? So those are the kinds of questions that you should know uh, or that you should ask. And um, those should be in your head. But if all of those check out on both sides, with both the agents, then it really comes down to who do you like better and who who do you vibe with cuz like i said you might be with them for the rest of your life you're marrying them yeah yeah totally and and beyond the grave too i mean I, yeah i used to represent literary yeah. states and so it's a it's a decision you're making for uh, perpetuity in many cases i thought that was a great answer yeah cool um, yeah, so, so so you made it, Aaron. It's always interesting because, like, I think most of, most writers here are, are are somewhat desperate. Like, if an, if an agent shows interest, you know, we're really we're really willing to leap into that. But you're saying that it's it's more like a job interview, also that the novelist is interviewing the agent and needs yeah. to, be, to ask those questions. Yeah, I think too. Not enough authors know that if you get one acceptance, you should go back to the rest of the agents that you queried and say, hey, I have an offer letter. Do you want to also offer? Because that could really set off uh, all the other agents to say, oh, yeah, this person must be good. I'm going to now read their novel. And they might offer as well. 
Yeah, that's an interesting question too. Um, so I like to, uh, the, some of the best writing advice I got when I first started writing was to always have something in the mail. This was back when you mailed things. Um, and the reason for that was to always have some hope out there that somebody was gonna publish your story. And I think the same thing applies for agents. Like I don't wanna just send a query to one agent and then wait the three to four months or maybe forever because a lot of the ways that agents say no to writers is by not responding. Um, so I like to kind of like, um, I've, I've heard about people who, who query five people at once. I kind of do it more incrementally. I'll query an agent like once a week or so. Uh, what, what kind of pace would you recommend? Is, is there a too much? I don't know that there's necessarily a, a perfect formula here, but I tend to recommend uh, having seven to 10 out at any given time. And the reason for that is twofold. One, it can take a really long time. Some agents are, you know, aren't, you're not gonna hear back from. Um, and um, and so you, I, I feel like keeping some momentum going is important. At the same time, you don't wanna query everyone in the business all at once for a couple of reasons. One, it's just bad form and agents don't wanna feel like you're, you're you know, spamming the entire industry all at once. But also it, it gives you a chance to adjust course if what you're what you're doing isn't working, so if you send out your first set of seven to ten, and you don't get any requests for 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 partials or anything like that, there might be something wrong with your approach. Either there's something wrong with the query or, or with those first ten pages, and it gives you an opportunity to kind of like dial back and take another look. Um, and so and then so if you get it, have a, um, a rejection come in just send one back out and just kind of keep going down your list kind of keeping it in that range and if you don't hear back from somebody in two months then send another batch out and just kind of keep it going anything to add Aaron yeah I just want to say that if an agent doesn't get back to you within the allotted time that they say they'll get back to you usually that kind of thing is on their website or you'll you'll hear it directly from them don't get angry with them because they are they might be taking their time. They might actually really like your manuscript, but it's just not the right time for them to take you on. Um, and if you get angry at them or if you send them something rude, then your all of your hope is lost. And also to that, if you do get an offer, another offer and you haven't said anything to that agent and they still have your manuscript in their pile, then you can go back to them and say, hey, I know it's been four or five months, but I got an offer letter. Would you like to you know, would you like to revisit my manuscript? Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, this question comes from Olivia. Uh, she asks, what are some of your favorite queries? We talked about mistakes and queries. Do you have any favorite queries you've read? Yeah, I, I, I definitely do. And I actually have three of them linked um, on my blog that some that I thought were especially good and, and worth worth drawing upon. Um, there, There's one in particular by, um, by Lisa Brockman who, um, had what actually I, I don't know if I'd recommend how short the plot description was but she packed in so much cool detail into just one paragraph of plot description in this really cohesive way um, that I immediately knew I was gonna re request the whole thing and then she ended up you know being a client and then her book ended up being this this big success um, so um, check, definitely check that one out. It's Lisa Brockman. It's, it's on my blog, um, and uh, it, if you go to the query letter section, and it's um, I, I thought it was one of the best I've ever read. How about you, Aaron? Any mom great moments? I don't have any specific examples, but I do know that my favorite types of queries are the ones that really match the novel in tone. Like Nathan was saying, that's so important, just because it really sets you in the mood for the novel. Um, I get a lot of magical realism and a lot of middle grade. And when you can really bring in that like silliness to the, into the query, or if you can really bring in the magical sort of feeling, I instantly pick up on that. And it's something that I will read all the way through and be really excited about. That's great to hear because I think sometimes when authors are working within a lot of conventions, like a cover letter convention or a query letter convention, sometimes that can take the spirit out of uh, their writing. So it's yeah. great that you guys are giving people permission to show their personality and their voice. Yeah, if you're gonna make a mistake in a query, make it by sh showing too much of your voice rather than trying to get too specific about your plot. I mean, it's that that flavor is so much more important than literally what happens. Um, so make sure you're getting that in there. Great. Uh, well, uh, let me see. Um, this person asks, what do agents charge? Is it upfront or percentage of book sales? How do agents make their money? 
It's always 15%. So if somebody's charging 20%, they're a scammer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, or, well, or they're they're for it's for foreign rights. Uh, it's it is fifteen percent domestic, and then and then usually it's twenty percent for foreign sales that's split between the uh, the primary agent and the um, the, the co agent. Um, and so yeah, but but it's fifteen percent. It's all, the agent should only be paid uh, when the author is paid, with some exceptions for things like uh, photocopying and the incidental expenses that the agent uh, may recoup. But if an agent is charging you for anything in advance uh, before you're paid, then something's wrong. Are there any other, uh, you know, because I think the, the book industry can be predatory, unfortunately. Are there any other things that people should look out to identify a scammer agent? I mean, I, I think one of the things to look out for are, are bad agents who don't know they're bad agents. Um, and uh, there, are, there are a lot of people out there who, who didn't have traditional experience coming up through, um, um, you know, uh, working with an agent like Michael Barrett or, or like Curtis Brown, like I did, and who just sort of put themselves out there. Maybe they even have a couple sales, but they just don't have that deep industry experience that, that you can really only have through an apprenticeship through with people who are really, really know what they're doing. And um, so they may not look like scammers. They may be, they may not even be trying to scam you. They just don't know what they don't know. And uh, so really, really look at the track record. Anything to add, Aaron? Yeah, I would say just if somebody is, if you're in that conversation, like I said, where somebody's offering you representation, um, you really want to do what I said, like know exactly who they're going to send it to and why. And that knowing who they're going to send it to, I think will tell you a lot about that agent. Because if they're going to only send it to independent uh, publishers, they might, you know, they might not have that establishment, like Nathan said, with the larger um, publishers, because really the biggest thing about an agent is having that connection to those publishers, because they're working on their contracts to those publishers. So that's very important um, mm -hmm. to know that they have those connections. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, let's see here. Since we're nearing the end of the hour here, Regina Wilson asks, what are the best resources to research agents? Do you have any favorites? Yeah, so some of my favorites are, um, are Agent Query, as I mentioned before, and uh, Publishers Marketplace is also a really good resource. Uh, there's there's the deals database there, um, which I, I believe is still behind a paywall, but it's worth signing up for Publishers Marketplace and re and getting the the daily news and kind of getting a sense of what's going on in the in the industry. And um, bear in mind that Publishers Marketplace and the deals database are it's not a be all end all. Not all agents report all deals. There there are lots of reasons for reporting and not reporting. And so if you look in there and you see that the agent doesn't have any sales or many sales. It may just be that they didn't report some things for, for whatever reason, but it can, it can be a good way of finding out who represents who and, uh, and, you know, narrowing down your list of agents and kind of like also ranking your top agents. If you see that they represent some of your favorite authors and also represent your genre, it might be good to put them towards the top of your list, things like that. Mm -hmm. How about you, Aaron? Yeah, I think also looking at interviews um, is a really great, way to get to know the agent um, and just to know better what you can put in that little intro paragraph that I was talking about at the beginning, like what they like and what what they want in the novel. Great. Um, let's see. I have one more question here and I think we'll wrap up things. Uh, Maureen Anderson asks, uh, how do you respond to a re rejection letter? Is, is there a way to, to kind of keep the relationship going and maybe send them the novel back after it's been revised one more time or send a new novel? How do you deal with that? Um, I personally would not respond to a rejection email um, just because it it's just going to clutter up the agent's email box and then you might be that that name that they remember. That's kind of annoying, <laughs> and and you don't want to be that name. Um, but that said, if the agent says, you know, this is really good, but I just it's not working for me. Send me some other work. Uh, then I think that's a really great opportunity for you to send them some other work or to send it to them when you might have gotten it 
edited again or something. I would say don't send them the same work within the year. Yeah, that's a good rule of thumb. Um, I I think that you know even though I was reading thousands of queries a year, I still remember queries. I mean, I still remembered them, and I knew when someone was querying me over and over again, and that person will be that name that sticks out to me as being someone who I'll be annoyed by in the future. So so don't don't assume that an agent didn't read something. Don't assume that they're going to forget you. Um, um, so and if you're gonna requery with the same project, um, it it should really genuinely be different, and it should really be a while before you try that again. Um, otherwise, if the agent wants to to read more of your work and wants to get to hear a see a revision of that work, they'll they'll tell you, they'll ask you. So listen to the agent. Um, don't clog yeah, don't clog their inbox with a reply to a rejection, um, barring some really personalized, super personalized conversation that kind of require like merits of of uh, a reply. Um, and uh, just tr trust trust that the agents um, are are reading everything and will remember. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell this one little story and get your take on it. I, I once was querying uh, for an agent, and I think I queried um, two, maybe three agents in the, the agency, not all at the same time, but after one had rejected it. And, and I'm, I'm not even sure that I was conscious of doing that, but on the third rejection, I, I, I believe I was written, uh, the response was, this agency <laughs> does not want to represent <laughs> this novel. So obviously somebody was probably talking in the coffee room, right? Well, or they might share an assistant. I mean, when I, I used to be an assistant for two different agents who both represented children's novels, and so sometimes I had to read the same queries twice, and because I was screening the um, the queries, uh, and so you know, it, it may that may just be a situation where there's there's one person who's screening for the agency and knows everyone's taste and is empowered to make those decisions, and so yeah, they might be reading four times. That's not to say that you shouldn't query multiple agents at the same agency. But but what I recommend to account for that is to, if you are going to query multiple agents, do one at a time at an agency and wait a little while between before going back to the same agency. Because otherwise, there's some poor assistant who's like, you know, uh, in New York who, who's reading your, your query over and over. I would recommend reading the rules, too, because mm -hmm. at Distal Goderich and Brett, they um, shared queries. So if somebody queried two agents within our agency, that was kind of a no-no. So that was a pretty much an automatic rejection. So uh, look at the rules when doing that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Aaron and Nathan. I really appreciate this. This is like uh, amazing. I think you guys uh, imparted so much wisdom and guidance and I hope uh, it makes uh, all the NaNoWriMo writers uh, so much smarter when they're querying agents and so much more successful. Uh, Ricardo, I want, I want to invite you back up one more time just to do a quick reminder of the special Readsy discount. Yeah, for sure. So if you... If you want to hire any of our editors or designers or ghostwriters, website designers, but I'm thinking in this case probably more editors for a career letter review, you just sign up using the special link that we posted in the comments, and that will give you a $30 discount on your first Reedsy collaboration with any of our professionals. So that link is readsy.com forward slash loves forward slash nano, because we love NaNoWriMo. <laughs> Thanks so much, everyone. Really appreciate you joining in and sharing your wisdom. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good luck, everyone. Thank you. Good luck. Bye-bye.